thing didn't fully go through because I'm not going to impart too much information and perhaps just tell a story and, and hopefully we can all think about this and, and have some wisdom together um, about how uh, technology and emotion may play together. Um, uh, the, the program set at University of Pittsburgh, I left the University of Pittsburgh, so now I just do work with this uh, startup emote. I'm not going to be talking about uh, the company, however. So technology and emotion. What do these things have to do with one another, right? That's my beautiful daughter. Um, so technology, what, is, what does that mean? Any thoughts? How, how would we define technology? Don't worry, you're not going to get it right. I, I wouldn't have guessed myself. But any takers? Throw it out. Don't worry, you're wrong. So you can be wrong. <laughs> tool for communication. I heard communication. I heard tool for communication. Good. Awesome. Actually, there's some rightness in there. So. I said electromagnetic radiation. Ah, electromagnetic radiation. Okay. Electromagnetic radiation, tool for communication. So this is actually the definology of technology. Definition. The application of tools and knowledge towards practical applications like achieving goals and solving problems. Hmm. What does that mean? So on the right we have a child who's hungry. On our left is a bow drill, um, early Native American tool used to make fire. Uh, bow drill is a tool that um, helps solve the problem of in early human history, they, they figured, uh, A, we had this problem with parasites. Right? They make our food dangerous. And B, it turns out we have these huge brains that consume 22, the, uh, 22 times the amount of metabolic expenditure as the rest of your body, that, um, that apes happen to have these huge guts to be able to digest the amount of food necessary. But with our weak teeth and our poor teeth, it take about seven hours a day of chewing just to get the amount of nutrition needed. And we came up with this neat tool, uh, this neat technology rather, using this tool to solve this problem. Solving this problem. Where am I pointing, by the way? Where should I point to? Yeah. Okay. okay. Sounds good. Here's some technology. New technology. All you have to do is do it and take care of it. Perfect. There we go. <laughs> tool solving a problem. Uh, so fire. The use of fire is a technology. Uh, it helps us cook our food. It helps our brains spend less time chewing. Humans spread uh, further. This is the uh, one of the earliest known examples of writing from 4000 uh, BC in uh, Mesopotamia. Uh, and. Uh, Oh, there we go. And writing, the use of writing is a technology. And so we use the tools um, to solve the problem of, of communication. And so the uh, written sort of oral history, there are people who memorize the Iliad and the Odyssey. Um, it's however far easier to write it down and, and transmit culture. Um, and so Increasingly, the story of, uh, of human culture is one of technology, like fire, like the written word, uh, like the printing press, the next generation of technology. Uh, we don't think of it as technology, right? Just sort of fades into the background. Now, at the time, printing, printing press rolls around, right? Riots around its use, bans on its use. People think it was work of the devil, right? It, it was a big thing. It was a, it was a, it was a scary thing, right? Brought a lot of change. Uh, so emotion. Any definitions on emotion? And don't worry, same thing. I, any thoughts? How, 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 how do we define emotion? Feelings, good. Body reaction to thoughts. Good. Feelings, good. Body reaction to thoughts. 
Good. Anything else in there in the mix? So there's some emotion. Cute. All right. So this is per Webster's. So I, I was going to get a talk. I'm like, okay, I got to put a definition of emotion in there because I have the definition of technology. A conscious mental reaction. And I'm like, okay, well, eight, you just lost me. Conscious is my daughter conscious that she's happy. Uh, subjectively experiences a strong feeling, uh, usually directed towards a specific object and typically accompanied by physiologic, so that's body, and behavioral changes in the body. Um, really long. I'm not sure if we really understand emotion. Yeah. Okay. So this is the this is the kind of work I, I was doing uh, at Pitt. So this is Dr. Mary Phillips, who has a, one model of, of how we regulate our emotions and how we experience emotions in the different brain pathways. Uh, yeah, sort of what we call the, the limbic system in here, the subcortical system that that has uh, sort of automatically reg. Uh, has sort of automatic emotion regulation properties. Things like, you know, our heart rate goes up when we're scared. And, and these systems kick into place without us even thinking about it. Um, as opposed to these more cortical regions, right? dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, a prefrontal cortex that's like a working memory uh, involved in, in consciously regulating emotion. It's like me saying, okay, slow it down. Deep breaths. Just a All right. So, um, so technology, emotion. What, where does that come into play? Right. Um, and in the technology, nonetheless, right? Like what this is, this is playing out in our our day to day lives. Facebook. What effects does this have on us? And so now people are beginning to study this and understand it um, a little bit better, begin to see the way that emotion uh, creeps into our world and, and even being able to measure it and hopefully better, better understand it. Um, so this is some work from the uh, a lab called the World Wellbeing Project. Uh, and uh, this is actually the, the, the lead scientist in our company, but this isn't, this isn't for our company. Uh, so what they did is they, they actually can take things like your Facebook feed and as a result, they can actually predict, based off the emotional tone that you use and the words that you use, predict things like your personality type on the Myers-Briggs. So this is the, the example of an extrovert. Uh, and, that, and surprise, surprise, extroverts like the party. So go figure, right? <laughs> you don't want to see the, uh, the neurotic... Neurotic is not PG-13. No. Damn, fuck, shit. <laughs> um, and so uh, we're beginning this emotion and, and this modern technology, right? These technology in quotes, Facebook, Twitter, um, the things that we think of as electromagnetic creation um, coming together. Uh, so. This is, um, this is a work from a guy named uh, Nicholas Christakis at Harvard. And what he did uh, is, this is, um, these, are, these are social graphs. So for instance, like this would be, there's me, and there's Dr. Chaudhry who knows his wife and his son, but I don't really know his wife and his son all that well yet. Yeah, I'm looking for him. Getting him. Uh, and, and so we have these, these different nodes of social networks. This is what a social network actually looks like, right? And it's not restricted to just computers. They've done the studies in, in like the um, uh, in sub-Saharan Africa and tribesmen, and it looks the same, right? There's somebody, and there's somebody's cousin, and his uncle. But what we can see is that um, health behaviors and uh, physiology and things like emotion uh, can actually track, we now, see how they can track in social networks. So um, this is a study of smoking where, or, or rather obesity, where the, the obese individuals are in the red here, right? Uh, and we see it over time. So we'll do one, two, three, one, two, three, ah. All right, one, two, <laughs> one, two, okay. 
So uh, obesity and things like smoking, uh, cardiovascular disease, they track amongst our social networks, which is interesting. Uh, health behaviors also do as well. Somebody quit smoking, they're more likely, you know, let's, let's move it backwards, right? You could think of it as that, right? The, the, the yellow and the red, the yellow, uh, yellow is like I smoke a little bit, red is somebody who smokes a lot, and then somebody quits, and now it's more likely that their friends are more likely to quit. Ah, uh, there was three. Okay. Um, here's a study showing um, uh, these are different cities. So they looked at different cities and uh, the extent to which people were publishing on social media uh, and taking, pulling out this emotional signal, right? So, so just, just like they took the extrovert and they said, okay, th this, this person we think is an extrovert, Similarly, they put out some of the emotional signal and sort of happy to sort of positive emotion and negative emotion and uh, looked at how it tracked and uh, as a function of rainy days. <laughs> so, um, so here we see uh, that, that with rain, so uh, if there's a certain amount of, of rain, uh, New York City has uh, a direct negative effect of rain. So if it rains, now mind you, this is, this is a population, sort of a function of population. I don't think it's standardized. Um, but we see like, hey, these big cities, when it rains, we have thousands of negative posts. All of a sudden, people's mood changes, right? Uh, and interestingly, what the effect is, we then see there's, a, there's an effect um, not only does it not, not only does it negatively affect these individuals, we're seeing uh, indirect effect in other cities. So, for instance, here we see New York has strong ties with Chicago, and, and so, for instance, it's raining in New York. We'll see people sadder in Chicago because of social media, because of technology connecting individuals. Right. Um, so. You know, I, I'm, uh, so when Ted was talking about, you know, we're all connected and increasing evidence, right? There's, there's ways that this is mediated, right? Um, social media happens to be one of them, and social technology. Uh, but, you know, there's a, when we think about technology and emotion, uh, there, are these, there are these more subtle effects, um, and then there's some direct effects, right? So. In terms of uh, these stories, right? Everybody, I loved all the stories today about these individuals, like um, you know, recovering from cancer. I mean, amazing. You know, recovering from all these uh, uh, these health challenges. I'm kind of in the opposite end of that. Like, I'm 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 heading into depression. I know myself. Look at this. This is yesterday. That's just noon to 8 p.m. That's before I started working. That's the amount of emails that I sent. Right? That's too much. Like what? Right? Seriously, like, not kidding. This is, uh, you know, in terms of when Dr. Chowdhury was talking about noticing yourself following, right? How do we use technology to better monitor ourselves and, and keep ourselves sane in this world? Right? So. You know, I'm here working on all this stuff. Um, and so part of it, and I want to open up to questions and thoughts. I don't want to go on too much about all stuff. But, um, you know, how do we create technology that's supportive um, tools and solving the problems that technology is itself creating? Now, <laughs> there's one way to go, right? He's using uh, the technology of writing to uh, protest. And, and lest you, in case you weren't sold on the writing as technology piece, think about this. Every person on this planet who is neurologically intact has verbal language. Uh, they, you know, unless they have a conductive hearing problem, they, they, can, they speak. Not every person on the planet writes 
It's only through the transmission of culture through writing. People are taught to, to write. It's spread from Mesopotamia to China, spread out, right? So, uh, and when we think about the role that, that information plays in technology and in today's culture, 90% of the world's data, of all the data that was ever created in the world, information, uh, by the best we can measure, was created in the past two years. Two years, Isn't that crazy? Past two years, 90% of the world's information has been generated. Nothing really good's come out in the past two years either, right? Like, <laughs> Like the Bhagavad Gita part two come out or something? So it, it's this, you know, we're in the technology tsunami. Uh, whether you love it or hate it, ultimately we have to figure out how to survive it and make it work for us. And, and, and I think the person who wrote this was thinking about that, that deluge of emails, right? But, but thinking in the broader sense, technology is tools to solve problems, right? We got a lot of problems. There's a lot of tools out there. Food for thought. Um, so then, and just remember, this is technology, right? So, in emotion and technology, it, it's there, there's a role there, right? And whether it's this or this, the feelings there. I bet the woman who got this from her 13-year-old son. I read it on a blog. She was like, she was so pissed because he was texting during school, right? <laughs> But, it, but he's like, Mom, I love you. So she's like, oh, I, I don't care. I love you. So it, it's, a, it's a balance that we need to strike. And, and there's some simple ways, right? So, uh, you know, I wish. So this is a simple way that I, one of the things I do, right? This is, this is from my computer. It's a screenshot. I'm creating this PowerPoint. I give it myself until 1 a.m. I'm a night owl. My computer's scheduled to shut itself down at 1 a.m. Right? It's a simple little trick, right? but that helps up my circadian rhythm, better entrains my emotions for my day so I get more sleep, like was put up. Um, so we, get, we have like, what, seven more minutes or so? Okay. Um, we'll do like two more minutes on, on a little bit, something a little further out there. Um, if you didn't think this was further out enough, far out enough. Um, and we'll have a little Q&A if people want. Put this back up later. Um, as part of that, th there's my email if you guys want to contact me. But I, I literally will not be checking it for about a month because, as I said, uh, I'm, I, I wasn't kidding, right? Like I'm too stressed. I sort of emotionally self-monitor myself, uh, and uh, I need a little downtime to get catch up on work <laughs> and uh, catch up on rents. So uh, we'll, we'll skip to the good part. Um, so if all this is mediated um, through our brains, which uh, we'll skip the argument for that, I think we're probably on the same page, um, that the key window of brain development is in adolescence. We used to think it was zero to three. Well, that's just structural changes, that the wiring really should get shaped during adolescence. Uh, here we see here, peak age in uh, 12 and 13. Uh, adolescence, the definition of adolescence is from puberty, which is a biological thing, right? You sprout a little armpit hair, boom, you're an adolescent. Doesn't matter. Uh, until uh, the taking on of adult roles and responsibility. Totally a social construct. And yet, we found that this brain development actually takes place on that timeline. So you get guys coming back from uh, Iraq or Afghanistan who are 18 or you know, let's say 20, and we're put in charge of responsibility, they actually look like they have the brains of 30-year-olds who, um, uh, or, or put another way, your 25-year-old friend who's uh, five years older, who's, but who's sitting on mom's couch, still has the brain of a teenager, and they have the brain of an adult. Uh, so 1800, that was from about 13 to 16. Now it's 11 to 30. We've gone from a three-year period of, of training and maturation and development to 20 years. What's that do? Um, and brains learn through culture, but increasingly culture is the culture of 
technology, written culture, as we said, right? Verbal culture, written culture, information culture, visual culture. Technology culture is brain culture. So uh, that's someone else's slide. Anyway, so um, thoughts, questions? <coughs> While work, like while working at the yes. same time, yeah, yeah, and 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 um, the one thing, and, and you hear people talk about that the kids are actually learning to multitask differently, um, uh, but at the same time, most of the research shows that, that multitasking just doesn't, it's just not that effective. There's about there's about two percent of people who could literally multitask, right? They have whatever we, wiring problem, like their hand could be writing something and I could be saying something completely different, right? But that's not most of us. Um, and the thing that to me stands out is with written technology, you have to seek it out, right? Like if, it, if it's here, it's not like assailing me. It's just this stuff on the floor. You know, unless I'm reading it, right? unless I'm taking the time, it's sort of like a, I'm, having to, I'm having to initiate it, right? But in that instance, we're being bombarded, you know? And so it, it's a real problem. Yes. I'm not so sure I'm asking the same question. Is multitasking contributing to the concept of ADHD? I think it is. Yeah. I mean, I'm a, I'm a develop, I'm a child psychiatrist. That you know, that's those are the kids I work with. And my hand gets tired from writing scripts for this stuff sometimes, and I, we you know we use alternative methods, etc. But um, and I, granted, I work with sort of sickest of the sick kids in the hospital, bipolar, trauma, multi trauma, etc. But um, yeah, I mean, if you think about it, is is it um, you know there's a, there's a rule in neuroscience called Hebb's law that which fires together wires together. It refers to the, the synaptic plasticity and the fact that that um, brains are like muscles. Right? You, you use it and it strengthens. And um, we are not uh, we're not having our children lift mental weights. Right? It's just uh, they're yeah. And so that, 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 that attention process never develops as fully. Yeah, in the back. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, think about it, it's like, you know, to a certain extent, it's like, uh, it's, you know, uh, imagine a, a parent in the 15th century being like, oh my goodness, he's up there in this room with those books, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's a little bit of that, right? And, and, and yet, you know, if, if you're in the 15th century, you wouldn't want your kid entirely in the room, with, like, spending his time with books, when in fact, like, the, the uh, and this is kind of going out there, but, you know, the, there was no, the role for scholars in society was not as high as it is now, and, and so there wouldn't be a need. He'd be like a, a blacksmith who had all this book knowledge but wasn't able to shoe a, a horse and therefore was, was not functional in society. Like that, that tool did not fill the, the problem set um, at the time. And so it's, it's striking this balance between like, you know, what is, how do we need to interact now um, and how does the tool let us? Yeah. And here I wonder about the kids who <coughs>
Yeah. Well, and, and it, 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 I'm sure it does. And, and there are studies and, and sort of pros and con like in both directions. But I, again, a little bit more out there, and this is more of like a thought experiment type of lecture. But you know, um, the, the when, when you say more human, I mean, I think we'd all we'd all say that. Well, yeah, like you know, being face to face here, it's more human. It's more. Um, there's people who disagree. There's people who say, well, I have more I have more bandwidth available to me if I'm in a virtual chat room, right? Because I, I could be wearing a somatosensory glove. It actually gets me tactile input, but also at the same time, I could be texting. I could have a layover of information about me that I know. Like, and it's like, whoa. And, and they're more plugged in. And, and the, like what, struck, what jumped out for me, and also the, the question from the back, is is during these, we have we have we have brains that are hardwired for social connection. Right? That's why we're. Uh, that's why humans won. People think, right? I mean, won. But. So where would you draw the balance mm -hmm. in order to maximize the benefits and minimize the downside? Yeah. Uh, I think. How as a parent or teacher or community member would you draw that balance? Yeah, I don't know. But I would begin with, I mean, I, I begin with one thinking about what's what's the desired outcome, but more so, like, going back to the social piece, um, we, you know, I see it with my kids um, who are five and three, and I'm, I'm lucky, right? I'm, I'm in this window where it's it's more shapeable, more malleable, right? And they've, and uh, one thing I notice is because we're hardwired for that. They'll see the they'll, they'll see the shiny thing. They'll see the thing, and, oh, da, da, da. and then if I but I say, hey buddy, like, how you doing? Like get right in there, right? And give him the and psh, this thing falls away because it's it's so much more rich to that that human piece that you talk about. And I think it's I think part of it gets to go in there, right? How do we how do we get in there and go there before it's too late? Because kids could be seventeen and they're like, mom, I hear you're going there, and and by then there's that's a, that's a drop off, by the way. Um, it's too, too late, and it, and it's they're now in that developmental range of adolescence. Which, by the way, like if that's the part where technology is shaping adolescent culture, who's creating techno culture? It's adolescence. And what's the job of adolescence? The job of adolescence is to break free of your constructs and then push the edge and push the boundary and then come back, right? To go out of the village and then come back on that initiation. So part of it is, and one of the reasons I went to child psychiatry and adolescent psychiatry, is creating these, um, it's like the initiation, right? The, the, creating these spaces that are a little dangerous. Like, you, your, parents can't, your parents can't raise you. You have to step out of that into this other place, this other dangerous space. You know, overcome the, the, the hero's journey, the Campbell thing, and then come back with these. Um, but but in, a, in a world where Note zero tolerance and oh, Billy brought a, a, a thing to school, right? But then again, you look at what happened. And it's like, well, what what are our choices, you know? And so part of it, I think, it tells adults stepping out on that edge and and saying, okay, well, we, we don't know, but we'll we'll be out there with you. 